各位贵宾以及媒体朋友，大家早安！欢迎莅临由数位发展部所主办、财团法人电信技术中心所执行的 Beyond Data 隐私强化与多元创新、隐私强化技术应用趋势研讨会。我是今天的 CEO Angela 卢一君。AI、5 G 还有大数据等前沿科技是飞速的演进，而政府呢跟产业也纷纷加速了推动数位转型。在当中呢，数据就扮演了提升政府还有企业治理效能以及数位创新的引擎。同时，资料隐私保护的议题也变得更为重要，隐私强化技术成为了保障治安的重要工具。而为了提升各界建构资安的能力，数位发展部以隐私强化和多元创新为主轴，举办了今天的研讨会。我们邀请到了来自新加坡、日本、以色列以及国内的产学代表等十位资安专家，将聚焦在国际趋势、技术创新、跨域应用等多元的议题，来探索新一代隐私保护技术的发展趋势。以及促进资料跨域协作的路径，为资料应用渐入隐私保护的思维，共同来建构更值得信赖的数位世界。那么今天活动一开始，让我们首先邀请主办单位数位发展部唐凤部长上台为我们致欢迎词，请大家以热烈的掌声欢迎部长。各位贵宾啊、呃，大家好，非常高兴能够来这边呢、哦，讨论这个相当重要的，我们现在叫做 trusted technology 啊，信任科技啊。刚刚还在跟宗成老师在讨论说，呃，这个电信技术中心呢、啊，中文名字非常好。那就像我跟两位外国讲者解释的、哦，信这个字，呃，同时有这个信号的意思，但是也有信任的意思。所以呃 ，Telecom Technology Center 今天办这样子的活动啊、哦，也是这个 trusted。Technology Center 在讨论信任科技的议题。那为什么这个议题现在这么重要呢？当然就是因为，就如同刚才呃主持人有说的啊、哦，就是呃大家都发现说要 train 一个很大的 AI 模型，那特别是要用呃我们自己的资料来做调整，所谓的 fine tuning。那这样子的状态下呢，它当然需要相当大的这个资料，但是这个资料呢，它因为里面常常就是有个资哦，所以这个在跨境流通上面，所谓的 free flow of data， 这个 data 呢，它必须要是确定是 non-personal data， 就是我们现在叫非个资数据，那才能够来多方哦一起来进行多元的创新。那因为各个领域创新驱动的引擎，不管是商业啊、科学啊、医疗啊、城市规划等等啊，这个都无所不在。所以一旦我们能够确保说它真的没有隐私上面的风险，是彻底的非各自的数据，这样子它就可以发挥我们叫做 anti-rival good， 就是所谓反竞争裁哦的这样一个公益的一个特性。就好像我们讲的语言一样，越多人讲这个语言越有价值哦，对个人跟世界哦都有贡献。那但是在应用的同时，如果是没有呃适当的这种治理的机制，不管是在法规上面的，或者是在技术上，或者是社会上的机制，那数据跟各自就是 non-personal 跟 personal data 任意的混合的话，那当然也很容易就会发生侵害隐私的情况。所以现在国际上面，呃，数位发展的一个焦点就是怎么样兼顾数据的利用，那以及隐私的保护。那在当事人知情，而且随时可以退出的前提下，像在台湾，我们的运动数据公益平台就是这样子的一个例子。那只要呃，在就是不管健身房啊、运动中心啊等等，呃，愿意透过这样子的隐私强化技术来处理，就可以大家把呃数据汇集起来之后，更有效的知道说，如果你只有一小时健身或运动或怎么样，而经常。达成啊、呃，怎么样子的效果的话，怎么样子的做法啊、哦，对你是最好的。但在这个过程里面是汇总啊、呃，及时的统计数据，但是绝对是不是呃任何各自的部分啊、哦、在里面。那我们今天要研讨的这个 PETS 就是 PETS 隐私强化技术的意思，就是去透过技术的方法来降低直接利用原始资料所衍生的风险啊，然后呢，同时保有数据的可用性。
。那我们的隐私强化技术指引啊，啊，目前已经是在我们的 Join 平台哦，已经贴出来了，是在一个预告的情况。所以很欢迎今天与会的大家，如果有空的话，呃，在呃与会之后听到一些想法的话，都很欢迎到 Join 平台找我们隐私强化技术指引，就会连到一个你可以逐字逐句留言的那样的一个共笔上面。那把大家实际上面在业界碰到的、看到的，以及我们这个公民社会呃想要守护的这些基本的权利，这两个是没有矛盾。完全可以调和的，那我们就一起来想一想要怎么样调和。谢谢大家，谢谢。谢谢部长，我们请部长留步。接下来呢，要邀请今天出席的贵宾跟讲者一起上台合影。And now we would like to invite the hosts and guests of honor to the stage for a group photo. First of all, we would like to invite Professor Hiroyaki Kikuchi from Meiji University School of Interdisciplinary Mathematical Sciences. 日本明治大学数学科学学院的教授兼副院长。And next, we would like to invite Mr. Oren Yokov, CTO of Chain Reaction Limited from Israel, 来自于以色列加密演算法新创公司的技术长，欢迎。紧接着呢，我们欢迎的是数位发展部叶宁次长 ，Mr. 叶宁 ，Deputy Minister of Digital Affairs。再来欢迎的是财团法人电信技术中心吴宗成董事长 ，Dr. 吴宗成 ，Chairman of Telecom Technology Center。紧接着欢迎的是阳明交通大学电机工程学系尤家木副教授 ，Dr. 尤家木 ，Associate Professor from National Yangming Jiao Tong University。再来欢迎中山大学资工系徐瑞豪助理教授。Dr. Shi Rui Hao, Assistant Professor from National Sun Yat-sen University. Welcome. 再来欢迎的是帝阔智慧科技吴杰汉产品经理 Mr. Jerry Wu, Product Manager of D Cloak Intelligence. 接下来呢，我们欢迎的是国家资通安全研究院资料架构总顾问方怡婷方总顾问 Dr. 方怡婷 Head of Data Architecture at National Institute of Cyber Security. 紧接着欢迎的是数位发展部多元创新司庄明芬司长 ，Ms. 庄明芬 ，Director of Department of Plural Innovation of the Ministry of Digital Affairs， 以及财团法人电信技术中心林辉堂执行长 ，Dr. 林辉堂 ，CEO of Telecom Technology Center，Welcome。好，欢迎所有的贵宾来到台上加入我们的合影。首先呢，请大家一起看向中间的摄影镜头。Please look into the camera in the center. Okay, how about a thumbs up for the photo shoot? Okay, thank you very much. Please also look into the cameras in the back together. 我们请一起看向后方媒体朋友的摄影镜头。How about we also pose for the media? Thumbs up for the media. Okay, thank you very much for joining the group photo. Thank you. Please take your seats. 谢谢各位贵宾加入我们的合影。谢谢，请大家回座。活化资料利用呢，以及强化隐私保护之间的平衡，是国际间非常关注的发展趋势。然而，如何来建立安全的环境，进而有效的来加以运用？那么，接下来呢，在我们的焦点座谈当中，将从隐私强化技术。国际间推动的趋势，来探究新的愿景。那么这一场座谈呢，是由数位发展部唐凤部长亲自的来担任主持人。我们接下来呢，就先以掌声邀请部长来到台上先入座。好，那么紧接着呢，就要邀请我们的讲者们入座。Let's now welcome our speakers to the stage to join the panel. 首先欢迎日本明治大学数学科学学院的教授兼副院长 Professor Hiroyaki Kikuchi from School of Interdisciplinary Mathematical Sciences of Meiji University. 接下来呢，欢迎来自以色列 Chain Reaction 的技术长 Please welcome Mr. Oren Yokov, CTO of Chain Reaction Limited. 同时呢，新加坡科学研究局的首席科学家 Dr. Jin Chow, Principal Scientist of A Star Singapore, will be joining us online. 我们接下来呢，就把时间交给唐凤部长。Let's now hand the floor to Minister Tang. 
Um, so this will be in English, uh, and I will speak slower for the interpreters. Uh, so uh, I personally learned a lot, and I'm very delighted that the three of you, uh, each one's presentation ends where the next one begins. <laughs> so it's a, a very long uh, lecture uh, that's very interesting and that focuses on something really critical, which is how to protect the data as it was being computed, uh, the data in use uh, question. Uh, and uh, we have questions from Slido, uh, that is the online system. There's already four of them. Uh, and uh, I want to encourage people in the same room to like questions on Slido. It's more democratic, so we know that uh, how many people are interested in which question, and so we can, in an uh, anonymized way, uh, prioritize uh, the answers. So this is the first thing. And second, I understand not everyone is comfortable uh, using Slido, so if you want to raise your hand, uh, you will be given priority. So anyone in the same room raising your hand, willing to uh, be identified, uh, then gets the priority uh, compared to the Slido questions. Um, so does anyone want to raise your hand? Because if not, I'm going to go to the highest voted uh, question now, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, the principal scientist, Jin Chao, to uh, answer first, uh, and then uh, maybe you, and then maybe the professor. Okay. So the first question, by far the highest voted, uh, says, so um, we understand that uh, the zero trust technology is very computation in, uh, intensive, uh, preserves both privacy and uh, data uh, usability, but it's not fully attainable yet for everybody else. So sometimes we still use uh, the so-called uh, the, um, the the ideas of the anonymized data or partially anonymized data and so on. Uh, however, this kind of anonymization technologies, as pointed out by all of you, loses some of the usability of data. On the other hand, if the data is large enough, maybe we still get some usability out of it. So how to choose the parameters and how to choose when to use such technology and when not to use these technologies, when to invest in more expensive zero trust technologies and when we can still use differential privacy for a while, um, is there any guideline or standard or best practices I think this is a very practical industrial uh, question. So maybe Jin Chao would like to uh, enlighten us. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I, I, think, I would say this is a yeah, very uh, good and uh, typical question when we uh, apply uh, past techniques to, to the applications. So uh, I think definitely uh, the different past techniques uh, what comes with uh, the pros and cons, right? And uh, Actually, for different privacy and all, all the, some other uh, uh, data anonymization, these techniques will be uh, used for, for some time already. So uh, actually, it's good for a certain uh, kind of applications. Um, let's say if, uh, if a different differential privacy, if uh, uh, it's used for like statistical uh, analysis and also the machine learning applications, well, if you add in the noise, that will not affect too much on the accuracy of the models of the result, then it's good to have because it will uh, provide you uh, almost the latent plain text performance. Uh, but, but then if, uh, uh, if the, the laws I did, right, will, will affect too much on the, on the uh, accuracy. So in this way, we, we, we need to consider other techniques, for example, uh, crypto techniques like homomorphic encryption, and the simple multi-party computation. Because this uh, kind of techniques can ensure the encrypted data computation uh, provided almost the same result as you compute on the, on the plain text. So it will uh, not affect, uh, affect the accuracy. But of course, it also comes with uh, computation, uh, uh, computation uh, overhead. So in this way, uh, we definitely we cannot utilize just one uh, kind of past techniques, right? In our uh, previous experience, we we were always like combine uh, different past techniques together. For example, homomorphic encryption is very strong at uh, 
uh, linear computation, for example, addition multiplication, right? These are very good uh, to be used uh, actually to do because actually will, uh, can utilize the uh, some packing techniques to do the parallel computation. So this kind of techniques uh, uh, can be utilized to accelerate the IG application. But on the other hand, uh, if we do nonlinear computations, for example, uh, uh, comparisons, or maybe uh, uh, do the uh, do this uh, do this nonlinear nonlinear computations, uh, then uh, the IG may not be uh, quite efficient at this moment. But in this way, we can utilize the uh, uh, secure multiparty computations to to do do this to solve these techniques in an interactive way. So uh, by combining all the techniques together and leverage their strengths and also overcome their shortcomings, then we can provide uh, maybe an overall uh, optimized solution for for the applications. Great. Yeah. So Thanks. the main message is that this is not a exclusive this or that. Uh, pet uh, choice. It is a toolkit or tool chain approach uh, for each yep. circumstance. Choose the one that fits best to the job, and actually they can be combined too. That's the main message. Okay, great. Um. Um, well, uh, I fully agree with the uh, with the combination of uh, different techniques. That's uh, usually usually the case. Um, because each has its own uh, pros and cons, so uh, you need to find the right combination. Um, I think that uh, there are two uh, ways to, or at least two ways that I look at it. One is uh, that how structured is the data that we need to use. Once we use, uh, if the data is very structured, uh, we can use more conventional uh, paths because it's uh, it's easier. Uh, if it's unstructured data, then we're in a more of a problem because we like need to use chat GPT queries. <laughs> uh, even medical files, by the way, uh, they are highly unstructured. If you look at the uh, medical history, so usually you have, you have to run some kind of uh, pre-processing by uh, AI just to get it structured, and uh, this processing by itself invades privacy, so it makes it harder to use uh, conventional uh, privacy techniques. Uh, the other aspect, as uh, Mr. Chow said, is accuracy. Uh, if you can use less accurate uh, results, then differential privacy and statistical methods uh, can be used. And, but if you need a very accurate result, then uh, more cryptography-based methods has, has to be used. Because, uh, and I'm going with uh, Mr. Chow's example. If, uh, I'm one, if I need my MRI scan to be analyzed, I really don't want to get statistical results on it. I want to get a very accurate result if, I, if the scan finds or didn't find anything. So this part, uh, but the most important thing is, in my perspective is, is implementation. It's more important that to have a good implementation of security and privacy technology than the actual uh, Technology, it's better to have a very solid implementation of even older technology than to have a not so solid implementation of very new technology. Hmm. Because usually the breaches and the errors come from implementation errors, not from uh, cryptography or statistical errors. So what I'm hearing is that uh, the newer generation of pets compared to the old methods need to be both more privacy preserving and also more usable. But that's just the beginning. Uh, even if we solve that, there is still a accuracy computation cost trade-off uh, that still exists, uh, even if we solved the previous uh, dilemma. And on that, we need very good assurance on the quality of implementation in order not to uh, go uh, misled uh, on the trade-off uh, between accuracy and computation cost. Thank you. That's a very good insight. Professor? Oh, yes. Um, I really agree that um, there is a trade-off between the utility and the privacy, even though the how much technology is advanced. Yeah, so there is no perfect solution for these problems. Uh, also, I remember that uh, Orange, you give a very good summarize of the table, of the technology and the purposes. 
I agree that I, I like that because, uh, for example, in the stati statistic data, maybe it's uh, less private. So therefore, maybe differential privacy can be used. However, the medical data is more sensitive. So maybe the secure multiparty computation is the best option for that. So therefore, it depends on the requirement of the use case and requirement of the uh, security. And depending on the such a requirement, maybe we choose the best pet technology for the purposes. This is uh, one thing. And also, the difficulty about the choice of the pe ad adequate pet technology is the uh, privacy is really subjective information. There's uh, some very uh, privacy cons conservative people and very privacy uh, uh, awareness people. Uh, maybe some people may uh, really depend, it, it depends on the uh, subjective uh, perspective, perspective about, against the privacy. So therefore, this is a difficult part. The, even if the Taiwan government some standards or the epsilon or K anonymity or something, some people may upset about that. So there is no standard way for that one. Okay. Very good point. Yeah, this is why we always emphasize that the people affected must be informed and also they can opt out. Like they can go back to the previous generation of technologies, even though it means pen and paper still they must be able to go back uh, to the previous generation of technology because we fully understand that uh, privacy means different things uh, to different people. There's different uh, expectations. Okay, so um, the next, so like anyone raise your hand? If not, I'm going to the next slide or question. Okay, so uh, the next question goes, so we understand the small and medium enterprises, they're, they're willing to invest in this kind of technology, <clears throat> but compared to like trusted environment, which are already used by cloud providers and so on, um, homomorphic encryption is unique in that it's very expensive <laughs> compared to all the existing other uh, pets of this generation. Uh, so is there a suggested way if someone want to try homomorphic encryption in some way, is there a way to do it at low cost? Or if the state is to offer subsidy, what kind of uh, use cases should one subsidize uh, to? Uh, this is a both policy question and also a market uh, question. Maybe uh, the principal scientist, uh, Jin Chao, would like to chime in. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree that uh, homomorphic encryption actually uh, is quite computation intensive at this stage. And the uh, trusted execution environment definitely uh, because it's native using native hardware to do the computation, so it's it's faster. But um, but you know that uh, actually using a trusted execution environment, we need to put our trust into the uh, the CPU vendors, for example, Intel, right? Uh, because uh, actually all the uh, like private keys uh, can be controlled by the company. So this uh, definitely will not be acceptable for uh, for some sectors, for example, uh, like government or some of the uh, uh, healthcare, right? If, uh, let's say, if they, they really uh, want to do this zero trust, right? So basically, they, they still need to go to the, maybe uh, the crypto uh, graphic based techniques because that is mathematical proven. And uh, coming to the, uh, Performance-wise, uh, definitely actually currently, uh, definitely you, you cannot use actually to do everything uh, because uh, it's not practical yet. So, uh, like, uh, but I, I see like uh, just now the Mr. Kelvin, uh, right, uh, uh, just introduced their approach to accelerate the IG, right, to maybe uh, to a very uh, good uh, practical uh, performance also. And, and uh, but for now, I think, you know, to use actually in practical applications, right? Uh, actually, we can uh, uh, utilize them into some uh, a range of applications. For example, uh, let's say uh, just now we mentioned that uh, uh, if the if the uh, computation is not so uh, deep, right? Uh, then we we don't need uh, very large parameters to do. Then the performance could be quite practical. Let, let's say uh, for example, let's take neural network for example. If let's say we, if we do a uh, very deep neural network, then we we need a very large 
security parameters, then the performance could be exponentially, uh, and the overhead will be exponentially low. But if we do a simpler network, whether machine, some machine learning models, or maybe logic regression or linear regression, right? This could be quite uh, done quite well by actually, for example, in uh, in some of our, our applications uh, in the uh, medical domain, right? For the some uh, like a genomic analysis, genomic data analysis, actually we can utilize the logic regression and linear regression models on the logic uh, on the uh, genomic data. So this could be uh, handled quite well by uh, by actually techniques. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, to conclude, I think currently definitely we need to carefully select the applications that can be utilized by IG alone. Yeah, then we can utilize IG. Otherwise, we can just use IG with combined with other techniques uh, together to provide a, a practical performance. Hey, so it's the same message we hear. That is to say, it's one tool in the toolkit of a system integrator uh, vendor, and it's up to the SI uh, to choose which one is so confidential or the computation costs not that much anyway because simple addition or aggregation or intersection. Uh, and then it's the SI that offers this as part of this full solution. It is not yet for a small enterprise to simply say, oh, let's just fully encrypt everything uh, that I put on the cloud. We're not at that stage yet is the main message I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay, great. Maybe do you have a different opinion? <laughs> Not really different, but uh, first one, un until we have uh, our technology out there, and hopefully it will solve the gap. Uh, and when is that? <laughs> um, I'm hoping that in, uh, it will be two, two to three years from now. Wow. Okay. So this decade? Uh, okay. Yeah, this decade, this decade. And uh, we're not the only one, so if, uh, uh, there are others that uh, we also have competitors, and. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, in the two to five years, we're going to see uh, all different uh, acceleration approaches for uh, for FHEs and other kinds of uh, cryptography. So that's the, the good news. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meanwhile, there are some smaller models that uh, can run FHEs. Mm -hmm. uh, some fi in the financial uh, sectors, uh, encrypted uh, database in uh, queries, uh, can or, uh, can be already run and be used, and I think that uh, uh, one of the gaps today is not only computational uh, complexity, but uh, software complexity and usability, because the today the software tools that uh, that are there are more, m too complex for uh, most of the users, so. There are challenges or uh, there, there are attempts by companies like Google or IBM or other startups to bridge that gap and bring on uh, simpler ways to translate models into FHE and uh, then to run it on existing hardware. Uh, so it's, it's really cutting edge uh, technologies, but, it, but it's out there. Uh, you can la download these uh, compilers. Uh, uh, open source projects uh, and try to use it uh, on your environment. Okay, so it's <clears throat> like we're uh, to use AI as an analogy, uh, we're maybe at a point where there's already people doing deep learning, but modern GPU deep learning not yet <laughs> invented. Uh, so there's still a two to five year gap uh, between now uh, and the full industrial use. That's your uh, analysis. Yeah. Okay, great. Professor. Okay. Uh, as for the homomorphic encryption, it's expensive, but I am not able to provide any negative information because I know the, um, uh, your company are doing the business of the homomorphic encryption. So maybe, yeah, there is another, some other companies. So it's really difficult, so which one is a good one for that purposes. But I, I just want to make a uh, remark about the homomorphic encryption is uh, in terms of the visibilities. Uh, Audrey mentioned that visibility is more important for the people to get more trust, yeah. And uh, maybe in terms of the visibility, anonymized data is most visible because it's a transparency. But uh, 
homomorphic encryption is better than the uh, TE uh, because uh, en enclave can be done inside of the hardware. So no one, have, no one check, no one verify that it's really computed correctly or not. However, uh, the homomorphic encryption is very good, can be used for the zero knowledge proofs. It's pro it can be proved uh, without revealing any private information. So I think that in terms of the, uh, in terms of the transparency, maybe the homomorphic encryption has some advance as a technology. This is my opinion okay. for that. So this is basically saying that um, any vendor, including Turing Action, but also your competitors, uh, if you say that you do this homework encryption on the chip, I can use a normal CPU and waste a lot of energy, uh, but get the same result uh, so that I can verify uh, that your chip or your competitor's chip is actually doing the same thing uh, as the CPU. But at the moment for Intel, for example, uh, there's very little a possibility for me to, in pure software to recreate what the Intel Enclave is doing, right? That's the professor's point. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I think that trusted environments are a very important tool in the total security uh, aspect of things. Right. But, but in terms of implementation, and I totally agree with the visibility uh, aspect, but uh, to add to that, uh, usually the problems lies when you implement on top of these hardware solutions more complex software uh, structures and there you usually find the vulnerabilities. Not uh, with the mass, but with the silicon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination. The, uh, I personally think that uh, the use of, of trusted environment is very important, but you have to keep the implementation very simple ah, okay. and, know what you, and really know what you get from it and build on top of it. I, I don't think it can uh, solve the big, both the, tr the trust issues and the visibility issues, as, uh, as you said. And when you look at more complex operations, it also has uh, downsides uh, there because uh, uh, there's a problem to validate the, the, the everything uh, when you use this kind of model. Okay, so again, again, we're hearing that this is a toolkit and we can use actually all of them <laughs> if the cost allows uh, and establish better security and privacy uh, expectations uh, for computation. This is uh, the message we're hearing. and. Uh, Yes. Oh, there's a hand. Finally, uh, please. Uh, I think this is a question for Professor Kikuchi and uh, Mr. Cha, because uh, Professor mentioned a very good question about the safety threshold for what kind of K or epsilon is good enough or safe enough. Uh, I, I want to talk, uh, how should we frame this question in terms of regulation, not, taken, uh, not from the technical aspect? Yeah, like when you say framing, do you mean like I mean, pollution level? Do we call it pollution level or do we call it noise level? No, I mean, level? I'm talking or about uh, if you want to make a law or want to revise the data privacy law and what kind of standards should we set in the law ah, okay. so for compliance? What's the governance process yes. to set epsilons for particular use cases? Or, is it, uh, or even if it is a right question, should ah, we set okay. a specific threshold or? Ah, okay, so, or whether we should even frame it this way. Yeah. Ah, okay, so both a policy question and a communication question, essentially. Okay, Professor. Yeah, it's a really tough question because uh, I'm not able to catch up the latest situation. But I, as far as I know, some of the advanced projects like the U.S. government have the using the, their statistics data using the differential privacy. At that time, the, they used some epsilons. And also, uh, HIPAA is a uh, uh, healthcare data in the US. They also specify the particular value of the K. So these uh, two examples sometimes are refer when we decided to choose the parameters. But uh, there's no guarantees. Even though the US government decided, they, they don't guarantee about that. So, and also, uh, one more difficult thing about is um, technology is going to be improved. So new AI technology has been developed. Maybe the K is K10, K equal to 10, is going to be compromised in futures. So no one predicted that one. So 
I think the, I, I'm not, I'm a professor, but I, I, I'm not a uh, policy maker, but I, uh, I really know about the, what policy maker annoying this matters. If they specify some particular values, they may be responsible. They may be some risk to be compromise this type of the values. Yeah. Hey, so this is like password length, right? It used exactly, to be that, exactly, yeah. that this long is secure, but no yeah. longer. Right? Yeah, okay. a good example for that. Yes, uh, so Jin Chao would like to chime in. Yeah, I agree with Professor Kikachi. Yeah, it, this is really, uh, it's not like a one, one solution fit for all, like I set one if strong for all the applications. And uh, I, so uh, I would say, uh, Usually, if we apply these uh, different privacy techniques, uh, it will be uh, done on some like uh, statistical uh, uh, applications, right? And to get the aggregated result, and so in that way, uh, you will not uh, recover any uh, particular uh, individual result, right? And uh, in, for example, uh, some of the applications in medical uh, and healthcare domain, and uh, so. Uh, to build some machine learning models, uh, deep learning models, we usually can utilize this uh, differential privacy. And uh, definitely it will be case by case uh, to set uh, uh, particular parameters. And uh, um, like just now, uh, uh, it, the, the good, it's, it's a very good to, to see it's, uh, it's just like the, par uh, the password learns, right? Even if you like set longer password, you are secure, but you, you are, very likely to maybe to forget, right? So, so it's it will be case by case, and also uh, I, maybe one one thing we could, could consider we, we consider the uh, public uh, or, or public accepted parameters, right? In uh, and used in uh, in in uh, in other applications previously, and uh, that can achieve good results. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh... I'd like to add something, not from a policy point of view, because uh, I'm not uh, uh, not from the government or academic, uh, but uh, when addressed with this kind of uh, questions before, uh, I think that another aspect, uh, important aspect, is the ability to not just opt out the information, but really to keep the information secure and safe, because I believe that any K or Epsilon or a method that you choose, if you look at it 10 years from now, uh, it will probably be breached. If, uh, if you look at the password example, the password will be too short. Uh, because this science is really at the beginning. Uh, but once the database is leaked or public information is, uh, or private information is out there, it is ve it's impossible to bring it back in. So I think that uh, uh, to be to be able to govern the data and to and to be able to pull it back in once you get uh, you understand that uh, mm. you need to change regulation is a very important uh, step in the public policy. Okay, so a very strong voice for opting out. Yeah, this is also my position. Uh, so um, any follow-up question? You're good. Okay, great. Any other question from the audience? Okay, if not, uh, let's move on. Um, another question asks, um, so we talked about the technology, uh, but many different countries have different ways in their cybersecurity policy when it comes to privacy and data protection. Some thinks it's part of the cybersecurity um, acts and regulations. Some think it's something else altogether. Sometimes it's in the same technical authority, even though different governmental agencies. Sometimes it's in the same governmental agency, but different technical authorities. So the relationship between cybersecurity policy and uh, administrative functions and uh, privacy and data protection. We just talk about what is the situation uh, in Singapore, in Japan, and in Israel, respectively. So maybe starting with Jin Chao? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I think uh, recently, like recent, uh, Singapore has uh, like put more uh, restrictions on use of the personal data. Uh, let's just give a very simple example. Uh, previously, if we uh, register some service, right, as some companies, uh, uh, we, we, we can provide all our information, like NRIC, uh, we, we, the, the IC numbers, right, or the, the address numbers. Uh, to to the company and do do the things they were, they were always uh, uh, 
be able to assess all this information. But now I think, uh, I think uh, the government has stopped this kind of uh, behavior. They, 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 put the, they put the restriction that uh, the company cannot, cannot be able to like, collect all the personal data from the, uh, from, from, from the individual persons. So uh, we can only like, provide maybe uh, three or four digits from our NRIC to the, to the company. So this is just uh, one uh, example. So there are a lot of other uh, uh, measures to, to prevent the uh, personal data from being leaked to the public. And, uh, and in, in other uh, organizations, right, in all the organizations, like uh, the hospitals, clinics, and, uh, and also other public sectors, uh, the, 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 the data will not be able to share or maybe to combine with, with others in, in our plain text or in, in a very uh, uh, lecture, uh, like a uh, uh, straightforward way. So in this way, uh, you will always like, when, we, uh, when they want to use the data, they always need to, uh, need to go through a very straight, uh, uh, very straight process and uh, maybe need to get approval from the data access committee and uh, all these errors are uh, used to protect the, the, the information for, for, for the individual persons and also the, maybe the, some organization personal data, yeah. Okay, I see. So it's still a kind of evolving landscape for different use cases in different parts of the ministries and the legal landscape as well because the, the new regime is a little bit new. <laughs> it's... Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, um, Israel? <laughs> Again, I'm, uh, I'm not really representative uh, of Israel here. No, no, uh, I understand. <laughs> uh, so in Israel, uh, there's, uh, we have a privacy law that uh, uh, is similar to the ones in uh, Europe. Uh, and I think that I'm not sure that if we comply to the G uh, GDPR, but uh, because uh, a lot of uh, Israel uh, industry relies on the export, then... Uh, yeah, we have to at least uh, the industrial parts have to uh, to comply with the GDPRs and uh, the privacy laws uh, in the U.S. So we kind of keep up uh, with that part. Um, the harder pro problem, in my perspective, is uh, implementation, the connection between the privacy laws and cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we get. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, data breaches uh, that also uh, ends up with uh, personal data being uh, being exposed. Mm -hmm. And this is the part that is not uh, uh, covered uh, as well, both in uh, uh, regulations and in uh, practical uh, authorities that have to regulate because uh, privacy is usually under the Ministry of Law. Mm -hmm while uh, cybersecurity can be all, through all different, different agencies, and usually there's no one agency that's uh, uh, working with uh, overseeing everything. Okay, I see. So uh, it is the GDPR that holds the kind of privacy expectations uh, unified, uh, like at least the expectations. But uh, cybersecurity, it's not uh, the same thing. So cybersecurity is up to each uh, ministry and agency. Okay, Japan. Japan, yeah, I agree that um, security policy is related to the privacy policy too. And uh, in terms of the history of the regulations, uh, I'm a computer science professor. I, I have no background of the yeah, history, but I, anyway, uh, cyber security law has been established or before the privacy regulations. So therefore, uh, we have the cyber security is more stable but I, however, uh, privacy is a really hot topic. And uh, when Japanese government decided the uh, regulations, they need to update every three years. So that's why uh, 20, 20, 2020 is the latest update. So every time the Japanese uh, privacy regulation a little bit uh, uh, up updating in order to uh, catch up to the latest threat. And uh, at that, finally, it, it comes to the, this situation. The, there's one big difference between the cyber security and the privacy security, or privacy, is um, if the data is compromised. P company need to export and need to uh, notify to the agencies. 
However, the inner cyber securities, they don't have to do that. Even if the uh, company maker find out some vulnerability of their product, it depends on their decisions to disclose or not. So this is the biggest difference. I, I don't know which is good, but I, it's uh, actually we still uh, under com um, discussion about that. Yeah, for this. So the privacy law covers more uh, operators and controllers of data yeah. compared to the Cybersecurity Act. I think so. When yeah. it comes to the mm -hmm. duties, yeah. Okay, thank you. Very clear uh, explanation. Uh, so we are nearing the end, so uh, we only have time for one more question. Anyone from the audience? Okay, if not, the top slide of question goes, um, so say if there is someone that says, okay, I'm, I'm a zero trust privacy provider, okay. Uh, and um, like in cybersecurity in Taiwan, if you say we provide zero trust um, identity uh, sign-in like FIDO or things like that, uh, we currently do have uh, the National Institute of Cybersecurity uh, that can test and verify and say that uh, this is the test you passed. Uh, the TTC also has a lot of cybersecurity uh, tests and verification programs so that people can know the properties if if not like 100%, at least uh, which percent, instead of just depending on the marketing material, right, of the vendor. Uh, but for privacy enhancing technologies uh, in uh, your countries, are there similar standard uh, testing labs that offer this kind of certification like the ones uh, here in Taiwan we offer for FIDO uh, identity um, identification or uh, device management or things like that? Uh, Jin Chao would like to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, in Singapore, uh, currently, I, uh, as far as I know, uh, that, that haven't yet. Uh, there is a like uh, uh, organization or some like uh, uh, who can issue this kind of uh, evaluation test and the certificate to provide the the past techniques. And uh, so, in this way, I uh, in Singapore, I think our kind uh, kind uh, approach right is to. Uh, first, we we uh, design these uh, past texts, and we uh, like through publications and the patterns. Actually, we go through the review process and to to verify our uh, verify our uh, design, and and uh, at the same time, definitely the just now uh, uh, like uh, Mister Yukav said, right? The implantation is very important also because uh, we uh, we if we if we develop our own uh, past uh techniques right we the implementation uh normally uh for the for for the uh, for some of the components right we 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 leverage the open source ones that uh that are uh reviewed by a lot of developers so it's proved to be working and uh, so for some others we we also like uh, utilize uh utilize some techniques like a formal verification to uh to prove that that this uh, our implementation will be uh, uh, will be uh, working and uh, as expected. So that that we we combine these techniques to to prove that uh, our solution will be be able to meet the security and privacy target. For this is our current situation here. Okay, I see. Uh, so the uh, important reminder I hear is that uh, a lot of this is end-to-end -end verification, not just component uh, verification, because individually they may satisfy some property, but equally important is how we're putting all this together uh, in an actual system. Um, okay, yeah. from you. Uh, so each one has a cyber security author uh, authority that uh, handles uh, the civilian <clears throat> uh, companies or entities that uh, holds uh, sensitive information. Uh, they provide uh, guidance and they also provide um, help when a uh, cyber situation occurs. Um, but uh, they don't have a real authority to regulate or to uh, to close down a business if uh, if something goes wrong. It's not a licensed uh, operation. No, it's not a no, licensed industry. Uh, yeah, 
so that's on one aspect. Uh, we also have a cybersecurity authority for uh, national, uh, like national important uh, institutes. Uh, and some of the services that they provide is also kind of a verification or validation services uh, for instances that needs them, but, uh, but it's not a mandatory issue. Uh, it's like a service they, they can uh, provide. <clears throat> in, in other aspect, uh, Israel relies on uh, international uh, regulations and international uh, uh, standardizations like um, the uh, American NIST and uh, the European regulation and so, and so on. Okay. So what well, I'm hearing is that uh, from NIST uh, or from ISO uh, there are relevant standards uh, but we are not at the point where we say if you don't comply to a degree you cannot sell your product or well, we're not at this stage. This is more like um, like individual companies and so on trying different combinations and there's guidelines, there's coaching, there's maybe encouragements and so on but we're not at a point where uh, you say you know only FIDO compliant authenticators allowed in the business. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Uh, okay, Professor. Um, I agree that certification is a good practice to ensure the, the level of the security and privacy. And the FIDO, FIDO uh, certification is one of the good advance, uh, good example for that. But in terms of the private pet technologies, it's a little bit hard to certify particular technology, particular software, particular algorithms because uh, it's still under construction. Yeah, it's still under research R&D. So instead, I think the, like the uh, ISMS is a kind of the certification, but it's not for the product, it's not for the devices, it's for the organizations. So as a, in my talk, I introduced some of the Japanese approaches or the tri privacy trust bank that what certified some companies, oh, you have the very high quality, high, uh, you spend, uh, you spend, make an effort to catch up to the latest pet technologies. Then Japanese government certify this company is very good. So this is a way to somehow certify to get the guarantee for that. I think the TTC is one of the good agency to certify this type of the, because it was the trusted, yeah, and also it's a neutral and it's independent from the government. I think that this is a one of the pre, one of the law they should law they should certify for that. Uh, we see the, the chair nodding <laughs> to your comments about TTC. Uh, maybe we do proceed with calling TTC the Trusted Technology Center. <laughs> uh, so I think the, the point I'm hearing, and very good point, uh, is that certification at the moment is maybe better at the organizational process level. So it's this organization or this data processor uh, that received the certification, not any particular product they're using. We're not yet at the stage where we can individually certify products. But if that organization, um, for example, provides um, notification, opting out, and things like that, like ISMS, we can evaluate everything that this uh, processor or controller does uh, in service, perhaps, uh, of the data, non-personal data users. Uh, but the process or the service itself is the target for certification. OK, that's a very good point. Um, and so, uh, finally, I'd like to ask the three of you, um, like, is there any like, personal takeaways or any thoughts uh, that you would like the audience uh, to take away uh, with? Is there any remarks or hopes for the future or uh, anything that you would like to uh, introduce uh, to our audience? Maybe we start with Jin Chang. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would say, yeah, the past techniques is really uh, very uh, emerging techniques and also uh, exciting uh, area to work with right because especially in uh, in this uh, big data and uh, and ai domain right uh, ai era right uh, and this this techniques really can strengthen the 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 advantage of uh, like sharing data and maybe putting the and also at the same time to ensure the security and privacy um, but of course, there, there are a lot of uh, difficulties to to handle, like uh, regulations, right, and also technical challenge, and also the implementation challenge. This will be always need to, yeah, need the the uh, 
cross-domain uh, collaboration, for example, the uh, research and also the implantation and also the engineering, right? And uh, also the law expert and uh, regulations working together. Yeah, I, I think this will be, uh, we, I'm, I'm sure this, these techniques will be like evolving very fast and uh, in, in a very uh, uh, good way. Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, I think you summarized it uh, very well. Uh, but my, my, my takeaway is that uh, uh, always look at uh, the, the big problem as a whole and not try to solve individual components, but uh, look at the entire process from beginning to end. And another takeaway when dealing with security and privacy is always think of the what ifs. Uh, what, let's look at, uh, let's try to think of, we have a data breach, and what happens then? And from that aspect, to try to design the entire uh, system and solution, because uh, sometimes we uh, focus too much on the components, but we miss out something, uh, something more major uh, uh, from the beginning. So. Uh, my biggest, my, my takeaway would be, or oh, think of the f the final uh, uh, conclusion or uh, the final result of what you're doing when you're, you're starting. Yes, the the idea, right, the, the up and right <laughs> of the quadrant um, to to advance to enhance uh, privacy right, which is human rights, of course, uh, and instead of just defending individual systems and components, that's the main message, Professor. Yeah, today I learned a lot from the Singapore situation and the Israel situation, and also I would like to do the do our best in Japan too, and in collaboration to Taiwan, and also. Uh, uh, I know that some company participate our privacy cup competitions because they want to catch up to the latest technology, explore for the best pet technologies because uh, it's still un underway. Yeah, and also uh, they need to prove that uh, we really uh, make effort for development of the R and D on the pet technology to the government. So. And also, I know the uh, Professor Jamu Yu participate in our competitions uh, from the Taiwan. And all, we are always uh, happy if we, some of you participate in our competitions. Uh, we want to explore new new standard for the pet technology in future. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think more events like that is, is great, right? In, in Taiwan, we do red team, blue team exercise, including international ones like the cybersecurity uh, offense and defense uh, exercise. Uh, but we don't yet have uh, privacy offense and defense uh, exercise. Uh, but as the professor pointed out, this kind of joint exercise is a really good way to not just improve the state of the art, but also raise awareness of the importance of privacy uh, in the digital age. So thank you, that's a very good message. So uh, a round of applause uh, for our uh, panelists, thank you. Thank you very much to Minister Tang for moderating this wonderful session for us. And thank you once again to our three speakers for your sharing and contribution. We invite you to take a group photo together Okay, great to see you, Dr. Chow. Okay, please look into the camera and don't forget to smile. Thank you very much for joining the group photo and thank you once again for your insightful sharing. Thank you. Another round of applause for our moderator and speakers. Thank you.各位来宾我们今天上午场的议程进行到这边告一个段落我们下午场的议程预计在一点钟的时候正式开始